Irving Gill wrote, We should build our house simple, plain and substantial as a boulder, then leave the ornamentation of it to nature, who will trim it with lichens, chisel it with storms, make it gracious and friendly with vines and flower shadows, as she does the stone in the meadow. There is something very restful and satisfying to my mind in the simple cube house with creamy walls, sheer and plain, rising boldly into the sky, unrelieved by cornices. I like the bare honesty of these houses, the frankness and chaste simplicity of them. California is influenced, and rightly so, by the Spanish missions. In the long, low lines, graceful arcades and walled gardens, we find a most expressive medium for retaining tradition, history, and romance. Irving Gill created one of the few wholly original styles of architecture in the United States. From Syracuse, New York, to Chicago, to work under Lewis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright was a fellow draftsman. Then on to San Diego in 1893, a town of 17,000. Old adobe buildings, earth forms he would translate into concrete borrow the U-shaped plan embracing a garden. Pay tribute in his work to the San Diego mission. He began at once to simplify, to clean off surfaces, take redwood indoors, wide boards, hand polished, set brick in redwood frames, borrow from Mexico the front door at the street, put nature to work for him. Green roofs, vines on arched walls, trellises on sturdy columns. Extend a house into a garden. Frame a twisted trunk, a gnarled form in a mission arch. He made concrete his material, and in 1908 stripped away projections and found the cube developed a grammar in concrete suitable to churches or group housing for workmen, planned around a community garden. Forms kept pace with his experiments. He resolved the shape of things into their basic elements. In 1909, he started one of his major works, Bishop's School in La Jolla. Memories of San Diego Mission in arched loggias, roof comb and curved pediment, with no attempt to disguise the concrete. Contrasted handmade tiles with materials of industry, skylighted interior halls, posed the arch against the cube. When new buildings were added, the plan turned a corner. Logias joined one to another. He tried out a tilt slab system in 1912. Interiors, turned wood, flush surfaces. The 1913 Women's Club, La Jolla. The walls were formed on a table laid with rows of hollow tile and four inch reinforcing bars. Metal frames for doors, windows, arches, set in place before the concrete was poured. The cost? $2,500. He saw tilt slab as a structural common denominator, allowing endless repetition and variety. He was builder, inventor, experimenter, but also artist. His material? the tradition of the past and the technology of the future, 
merged to shape the present. Then reaction, imported styles gained favor. Gill continued to express his classical truths, but by 1919 he was swimming against a growing eclectic tide. The Dodge House was one of his last great ones. Structure was his permanent principle, but he planned as well for the impermanent principle. Vines, trees, shrubs, shadows, and subtle shadings. He planned from lot line to lot line, left nothing to chance. Selected each tree, plotted the curve of the drive, prepared vistas. Landscape and architecture were treated as one, complementing one another. Trees to throw shadows, walls to receive them. The arch is a frame for nature. The main entrance is through the porte cochere on the side. The Dodge House is not a fragile heirloom. With its eight inch reinforced concrete walls, it is substantial as a boulder. The keys to the plan are the central hall and the recessed patio on the north. A principle of Gill's. The front door opens and one steps from shadow to light. In the Dodge House, the steady north light from the high windows in the open stairwell. Light plays on the patterns of the Honduras mahogany paneling, defines spaces and volumes, lifts up the eye. Spaces flow vertically and horizontally. To the west, the living room. Gill's Quaker conscience speaks in his words as in his work. We have long been experimenting with the idea of producing a perfectly sanitary, labor-saving house with no place for dust to lodge or vermin to exist. In the game room, he designed the tiles of the fireplace. The handcrafted and the products of the industrial method coexisting, adding to each other. The fine, flush detailing of mahogany paneling and cabinet work from skilled craftsmen predicts the smooth interior finishes of the architecture of the 30s. He designed the brass hardware for cabinets and windows and directed the sand casting. An easy flow of plan from living room to game room with French doors on two sides to porches, on the third to the recessed patio, the plan of Ramona's marriage place, of which he wrote, built around three sides of an open space, this house plan gives privacy, protection, and beauty. It is hard to devise a cozier, more practical scheme for a home. In the seclusion of these outdoor living rooms, their nearness to the garden, the arrangement is ideal. The patio leads to the hall. To the east of the hall is the dining room. Its French doors open onto a dining court, framing a long vista.
The door to the kitchen is from Gill's design. Color in movement to reflect on walls. Kitchen walls could be washed down. They were coved into floor and drain board. Skylights. Broad windows facing a garden. The breakfast room with built-in buffet cantilevered out from the wall. Two steps down to the dining court, lighted by the morning sun, protected by walls pierced with arches framing trees and shrubs. The hall, an intersection of two axes, ascending to the light The landing is a bridge leading across the bank of north windows. The clean, square, mahogany sticking of balusters, the squared handrail, repeat themselves in the second floor balustrade. It is a style based on simplicity and repetition. The second floor hall, the paneling in the same idiom, a recessed storage cabinet for linens. Four bedrooms open onto the great lighted space of the hall, each of the bedrooms with its own balcony or deck, its own bathroom, skylighted. All details received his attention. Nothing was too trivial. Views from a bedroom on three sides. His walls were pearly gray, a blend of white and primary colors to reflect the hues of trees and gardens. From the patio, the north garden a long vista. He planned delights for the eye. The pattern of brick. He shaped metal, invited color, injected mosaics. water, islands of color in movement from patio to pergola, mosaics of a fountain, reflecting color on walls, light piercing the green roof of pergola, green trimmed openings for the eye to move through the stability of structure, the movement of shadow upon walls, quiet banks of windows, a play of forms, the breaking up of volumes and surfaces as in cubist painting of the period. The idea was in the air. Architects in Europe were working in the same direction independently and armed with his talents as a builder and Lewis Sullivan's luminous idea of simplicity, Gill sought the nature of concrete. He left a legacy of inventions. These are now standard practice and a legacy of beauty. He was one of the small band of men at the turn of the century who spoke for the future. All his senses were open to place, to climate, to the tradition of the California missions. To this he added the dawning turn of the century technology and his genius blossomed. 
The Dodge House is a record of his genius. It has a classic, ageless beauty. He called it simple, plain, substantial, and left the ornamentation of it to nature. Now the bulldozers wait for the trees and gardens which half a century have matured, for the house which time has not touched. We prize the distant past, but if the immediate past is ripped away, there will be no distant past for the future. The continuity will be broken, our heritage diminished. There is a hole in the fabric of history. <laughs>